I did see myself as a novelist, even though I quit, was having trouble finishing this first novel. Um, and after it was published, it was only read by about 10 people. And, but they happened to be 10 people who gave it to 10 other people who, and eventually, and it, you know, it, it not only was not a commercial success, it wasn't in any, by any means, I don't think, um, a success on its own terms. I mean, it, I didn't know how to do it. And, I, and it ended up, because, because I didn't know how to do it, I wanted to have a shattered narrative, but I didn't have a clue how to do that. And so it was confusing, and so the publish, publisher pressed me to straighten out the chronology. So it became just a simple novel with a flashback, which wasn't my intention at all. But anyway, it did get me. Enough people read it so that it, so that I was offered a contract for a second novel. I just wanted to make a, to write a fast novel. I mean, you always have a, a vision of what, what kind of object a piece of fiction is going to be, or anything that you're making. Uh, and in that case, it, it was it was going to exist in the white space uh, between the paragraphs. It was going to exist between the paragraphs, between the chapters. Some of the chapters are only three or four lines long in that book. And I found a way to speed it up by I had started it just because I didn't know how else to start it. I'd started it with some first, with some, two or three three characters have short first person statements. And then it goes into a close third for the rest of the for what appears to be the rest of the book, but as the book comes to an end and it starts gaining momentum, you can you can pick up a lot of momentum by going back to the this device from the beginning. Oh, this sounds so technical. <laughs> um, you go back to the you go back to the, that first person in shorter and shorter bursts, and it really gives you a lot of speed. So I was sort of thrilled with that. I always want everything read in one sitting. I mean, if you can't read it in one sitting, you're going to lose the the rhythm of it. You're going to lose the shape of it. Um, I mean, I myself love to read those Victorian novels, which go on and on, and you read them. You don't read them in one sitting, right? You might pick them up over the course of a summer, but that isn't the, isn't isn't what I want to write. We were friends for a long time before we decided to get married. Um, I met him. He was working for Time. He was writing foreign news for Time. And he, he was just someone I liked, and he made me laugh, and we would occasionally have lunch. We had friends in common. And um, then um, for some reason, I, mean, I don't remember exactly why, uh, one, one night we had dinner and he said he was going to drive for Hartford the next day. He was from Hartford. Did I want to come up? I said, sure. So I went up to Hartford, where his family lives, lived. And I was so taken with this entire family that, that we started going, seeing each other in a more serious light. And... Really, at that time, um, he was, as I said, working for time. I had published one novel. Neither one of us was 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 very well established in a. And we went to California and did you know, and started supporting ourselves by writing pieces. So that required one or the other of us. To, me to read his pieces, him to read my pieces, and so we began to trust each other as a first reader.
Well, you did A Star is Born in 1972 or three, yeah. Um, it was, it was that that movie was actually John's idea because it was it was conceived as a rock and roll remake of A Star Is Born, with, and I mean the names that came to mind, were not necessarily the names that were gonna were going to be in it, but it was, but it was just two faces. I mean just two just 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 it was Carly Simon and James Taylor. And. Uh, Warner Brothers picked this up right away because they had the, they had a lot of music, so they got the idea. I mean, they had Warner Brothers music, and so they so it was very easy to set up a contract. And Warner Brothers set up so we said we could do the research. I mean, we went we went out on tour with bands that summer, and then wrote the screenplay, which we had a lot of fun doing. Because it was, it was it was totally researched and it was it was fun, and you'd find yourself in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, on a summer night with a with a with a really bad English metal band, you know, I mean, just hopeless, uh, and being really thrilled. Um, then then it got to be heavy weather on that picture because the question of casting came, came up and. And it just turned out to there turned out to be a lot of other other personalities involved, you know. What struck me about the Manson murders was how at the, t the moment they happened, it seemed as if they seemed inevitable. I mean, it seemed as if we had been moving toward that moment for about a year. There were a lot of rumors about stuff. There were a lot of stuff going on around town, which you would kind of hear about on the ed edges of your mind and not want to know any more about. But it was, I mean, it was amazing to, when you, you know, after the, after the, after the fact, it was kind of amazing to see how many lives had intersected with the Manson families. But I can remember. We had a babysitter from Nye Reeds in, and she was very frightened on the night of the murders, or the, day, the afternoon when we heard about the murders. And, and I assured her, don't worry. It has nothing to do with, with us, and, but, it, but it did. It had to, it had to do with everything. Then I, later I was, doing, I was interviewing Linda Kasabi, and it was the real person wheel person. I, well, she, she wasn't the wheel man, she was the wheel person in the, for the for the Lobby Anka murder. And I can't remember, maybe also for Tate. Uh, but anyway, the night they did the Lobby Anka murder, they were driving along Franklin Avenue looking for looking for a, a place to hit. Now that's where we lived. We had French windows open, lights blazing all along the, on the street. John died in, in December 2003. I started writing it in October 2004. Um, in between, Quintana had been in the hospital the whole time, so I really was not thinking about writing anything. Then I had to do a piece about the campaign that year, so I did the conventions. And then I had to, then I realized I didn't feel like doing the book I was on a contract to do. And at some point I started, I had started making these notes, and so I decided to do that. That's something that everybody who is, who goes, undergoes a death, is, and it finds themselves grieving, is obsessed with, or, or, or maybe overly focused on the idea that they can't show self pity, that they can't display self pity. They have to be strong, right? And actually, there are a lot of reasons why you're going to feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> I mean, if, but it's it's your, it's your first concern. I made a decision 
in my when I was in my early twenties, I was writing a first novel at night. I was working for Vogue during the day, and I didn't. I was bored. With, I was bored with working for Vogue, and I was having trouble with the novel. And I was living in one dark room, and I was tired of living this way. And so I decided to become an oceanographer. So I went out to the Scripps Institute to try to find out how to implement this. And of course I learned that I was so lacking in basic science that I would have to go back to, you know, the seventh grade <laughs> and start over. So I didn't do that. I just read everything I could get my hands on. From I taught myself to read, or my mother taught me. It, it, who knows who, how I learned to read, but I didn't learn to read. I was, it was before I went to school. And so I would just I would go to the library and just take things off the shelf. And, and my mother had to sign a piece of paper saying I could take adult books. And I just read so ravenously that I would read through and through 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 whole categories, like um, I, would, I was I was crazy about reading biographies because it told how you got from where from from the helpless place I was to being Catherine Cornell, say. <laughs> I mean, I liked it. Hemingway was those sentences just knocked me out. In fact, I taught myself to type by typing out the beginning of a Farewell to Arms and a couple of short stories. And while, I mean, I was basically just trying to learn how to type, but you get those rhythms in your head. The thing about, the thing about Hemingway's sentences is that they are, they are really loaded. I mean, the, 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 every, every comma and absence of a comma makes a huge difference, and it's really been deliberated. You can, I mean, this is this is also true of Norman Mailer. Who it, people sometimes don't realize what a great stylist he is. One place you notice it is in the Executioner's Song, where he was using a deliberately reduced language. Um, and another place you notice it is in the changes he made which I think appear in advertisements for myself, the changes he made on the Deer Park. Um, I mean, they were changes of, he calls it totally rewriting it. Well, it was totally rewriting it in terms of its effect, but it was very, he was actually doing very little. He was breaking up the sentences. I didn't go to school for a few years. I mean, I went to kindergarten and I went to first grade, but then it, then it was World War II, and my father was in the uh, Army Air Corps, and we were following. He didn't leave the country, and we were following him because he was overage. But we were following him from place to place. So sometimes I went to school and sometimes I didn't until about the fourth grade, I guess. So I missed. There are certain things I missed, like geo, like not like uh, subtraction, and I still have trouble subtracting. Well, there was no place to live during World War II around army bases or, or airfields, I mean, because they were, just suddenly there was this huge influx into the town, of, and I mean, it, it, there was just no place to live. I mean, I remember when we got to Fort Lewis, which was the first place we went, uh, I can remember my mother going in every single day to the to the to to the army housing office, which was in town, to see if there was a room that day. And meanwhile, we were living in a hotel um, with with a shared bath. I mean, I don't know whether it was because it was a bath. I think it was in sort of a nice part of town. I don't think it was a bad hotel, but it was a period of. American life when hotels didn't necessarily, hotel rooms didn't necessarily come with bathrooms, you know. So my mother would empty, I remember her emptying an entire bottle of, of pine, pine, 
Pine sanded disinfectant into the bathtub every time she gave us a bath. <laughs> I, mean, it was, I think it had an enormous influence on. It was, a, it made me feel perpetually like, like like an outsider. I was an outside. I was and also it it very rapidly punctured the idea that I that I was smarter than other people because in fact I was. I'd been put ahead in California schools, and I was, of course, because then I hadn't gone to school for a couple of years, it immediately put back. And so I was kind of the, the, the dumb, dumb new girl in the class. And so that had a certain effect. And as far as my sense of place, I mean, I was, I was always yearning. I idealized. Sacramento in such a way during those years. I mean, I was just yearning to get home. I was nine or ten when we stopped oh, okay. moving around. When you stopped moving around? Yeah, we came back. My father went to, he was, I think, I think we came back to Sacramento in 1943 or early 44. He went to Detroit, and we didn't go to Detroit with him. We went to Detroit to, to settle out contracts. They were trying to settle out the World War I contracts so they could begin to settle out the World War II contracts with, with the defense contracts. Uh, so he was working on that. No, he came back at, after, you know, when the war ended. But I think Mother just couldn't face looking for another room in Detroit, and this one in Detroit. No. I mean, not not at that time, no. I mean, not during that grammar school period. Um, when I got back to Sacramento and 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 was sort of caught up, um, there were teachers who were very helpful. You know. And I remember a high school English teacher. And I remember. Um, a another high school English teacher who wasn't mine, but I knew her because she was an actress, and I was doing a little theater at, 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 at the Sacramento had a had a repertory theater, and I was playing I was playing children because I was small, you know, I was small and old enough to go downtown by myself, so so that was a perfect setup. I could do, I could go to the rehearsals at night and still look like a tiny child. So she was so she always had the lead in these plays that I would play the child in, and I so I became very fond of her. Vogue used to have a contest for college seniors called the Prix de Paris, and um, my mother had pointed it out to me when we were in, living in Colorado Springs during the war, and we were snowbound and we were looking through Vogue. We had all these little entertainments, <laughs> and, and she thought it would be, she, she pointed it out to me as something I could win when I got old enough. So, lo and behold, I entered it and I did win it. So the the prize at that time was you, 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 you was a job. For the first year, I think all I did was read old Vogues. Uh, I read through World War II in Vogue. You know, I mean, it was kind of interesting and heartbreaking because there was Vogue had a piece in 1941 before December 7th, but not long before December 7th by a report sort of a commentator of note named John something Vandercook. And it was about Pearl Harbor. And he kept talking about it as our our one our one our one fortress in the bat in the vast Pacific. And I sat there reading it with tears running down my face. And then I you know then I started writing copy for Merchandising copy, and then promotional copy, and then finally editorial copy. I was in the feature department. 
I was doing pieces for other magazines too, um, and I I knew I could do do pieces for magazines, but I didn't. That isn't actually what I I was trying to write a novel at night. And and I I did not see for myself a career on the staff of a magazine because I simply wasn't. I had no interest in, 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 in the politics involved. I had no interest in dressing right and doing all the things that, that you had to do if you were on a career track. Oh, dress code. I mean, you had to wear a hat in the office at that time. And you, I mean, and in fact, the nurse at Condé Nast told me that, assured me that the reason that I had a cold was because I wasn't wearing my hat in the office. She said, you lose 90% of your body heat through your head. And I mean, there was a great metaphor in what she was talking about. Of course, the reason I was sick and not getting and not happy is because I wasn't wearing my hat in the office. I wasn't playing the game. We were crazy about it. We just loved it. And I mean, I didn't even notice that that six months had slipped into a year. I mean, John must have noticed because he must have told them he was going to be gone another six months. Um, but it was, it was just a whole, it was a very liberating place to, to, to live after, after a period of living in New York. I mean, it was just easier to do everything, like take your clothes to the laundry. He left time after either two or two and a half years. He was he got a letter from the managing editor at that time, saying that either either come back or or it might be time to quit. And basically, he'd just been hanging on. He'd been staying and sort of stringing this along because he wanted to stay on the health plan. But we converted the health plan and moved on. <laughs> I don't know, John was between books. He, he was sort of restless. Our daughter was at Barnard. Um, we, had, we had lived, we were living in Brentwood Park in a house we had moved to when she was in the seventh grade so she could go to school in town. And it just suddenly it seemed as if there was nothing particular, no particular reason to we had a we had a small apartment in New York then, and we were spending a lot of time in this small apartment in New York, and it seemed kind of silly to be supporting this this house and dog and Meyer lemons and which got FedEx to us in New York. I mean, <laughs> and and meanwhile living uncomfortably in this small apartment in New York, uh, it, it wasn't adding up. We moved in April of '88, and in June I had to come back to Los. To Los Angeles to do a, uh, I was doing a piece on the campaign, and it was I came out on Jesse Jackson's plane just before the California primary in June, and the plane landed at LAX, and we got on a bus to go to a rally in South Central, and I was just in tears the whole way. I just sat, I, I couldn't even deal with the rally because it was so beautiful. Los Angeles was so beautiful, and I'd given it up. <laughs> um, it took me a while to get th get sorted out. I mean, to get it took me. I mean, I've still got boxes that haven't been unpacked. I can't go on if it's not pretty much. The way the way it sounds that, that it should be, I mean, so that at the toward the beginning of a book, I will go back to page one every day and rewrite. I mean, I'll start out the day with some marked up pages from I've marked up the night before, and by the time you know, by the time you get to page maybe 270, you're not going back to page one necessarily anymore, you, but you're going back to page 158 and starting over from there. Well, I didn't like it when I first began using it uh, be, 
it's where it's helped me a lot is in nonfiction, because which is a kind of different process in that you've got research, you've got your notes, and you can kind of block it. You can block a a whole. You you can make another fi a new file with a whole. Make it. You, you can kind of block out. When I say block, I mean as you block something on a computer, you can block what you want to work on for the next ten pages and put it someplace and then you can kind of carve it down and carve it into shape which that's not when you're writing fiction you don't have your notes necessarily I mean you don't you, you, you don't you don't carve it's not like a piece of sculpture it's like a watercolor this book had so complicated a plot that I had to write it in about three months in order to keep the plot in my mind. Um, so it's too complicated to explain, but basically she gets she gets set up and he gets set up on on two different she is supposed to she is set the way she is set up is she is supposed to have killed him. She kill she apparently kills him. Now actually she doesn't kill him. Someone else kills someone a sniper kills him. But she is set. But she is she is targeted as the as the as the alleged assassin because some Sandinista literature will be discovered in her hotel room. I mean, it was just a double setup. I work every day. Um, doesn't. Sometimes I don't accomplish everything, anything every every day, but if I don't work every day, I get depressed, you know, and and get afraid to start again. So I do something every day. Now, obviously, today I'm not doing something, and tomorrow I'm not doing something because I'm flying. But so it'll take me about three days this week to get into doing to working again. I had a strong feeling that it was necessary, that there was no reason to trust the reporter unless you knew where the reporter was. And if you didn't know where the reporter was standing, then, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I really objected to the, to the notion of objectivity, of the Swati song. Objectivity because it didn't seem to me very real. The reporter is always standing someplace. I don't mean that he is biased, or I just mean that he. You just want to know where he's standing so that you can triangulate different reports from different people against each other. It never feels difficult to me. Um, I mean, in essence, you write. You're always revealing a difficult part of yourself, whether whether it's. Um, it may not be a, a part of yourself that looks as difficult as other. There are, there are parts that look more difficult, but in fact, they're all difficult. And you get you get you get kind of used to doing that. In fact, it's sort of the nature of the. Of the thing. If you are doing a piece about somebody, and even if you admire them tremendously and express that in the piece, express that admiration, and they, if they're not used to being written about, this doesn't hold true of public figures, but if they're not, if they're people, if they're civilians, they're not used to seeing themselves through other people's eyes, and so they will always you will always see them at a slight, at a slightly different from a slightly different angle than they see themselves, and they feel a little betrayed by that. I don't know. Isn't it? Isn't it odd? Uh, I mean, I mean, it's hard to know what whether it matters to large that, that's the really discouraging thing it's hard to know whether it matters to large numbers of americans 
um, whether they somehow if we could quiet down and maybe not communicate for a period of time everything might cool off and people wouldn't jump into these reflexive polarized positions.